Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Productivity Commission. Um, I'm Jagjit Chadha, the Director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research that hosts the Productivity Commission uh, on behalf of the Productivity Institute, um, the ESRC's Productivity Institute, which is centred at the Alliance Manchester Business School. Um, the Productivity Commission is our inquiry to try and understand more clearly the factors that have contributed to the productivity slowdown, um, productivity crisis, or productivity puzzle, however you want to form that, 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 that story about what's been going on in the UK, um, particularly um, since the financial crisis. So far, the Productivity Commission has undertaken um, evidence sessions on the national, regional and sectoral problem, and also on the international best practice. Uh, and so I'm delighted this afternoon to move away from talking to people who undertake research at the frontier level to talking to people who work very close to the policy frontier. Um, so I'm particularly pleased today to welcome Jesse Norman, uh, the Right Honourable Jesse Norman MP, uh, Conservative MP and former Treasury Minister, and Kitty Usher, uh, formerly an MP uh, chief, and currently Chief Economist at the Institute of Directors, and also formerly uh, a Treasury Minister. Uh, she said on her behalf that she'll no doubt say this a minute she's speaking in a personal capacity this afternoon rather than representing any iot views and in the end we all ultimately speak i guess in a personal capacity um i'm joined as well today by a number of our commissioners and i'm delighted they've been able to join us and they will come in and ask questions of those giving evidence as we move through uh, the afternoon um and i want to thank the witnesses for making time at what is a terribly worrying moment um, nationally and internationally to consider the long run and indeed it's the long run i think we need to address when we start to think about productivity it's the long run that i think we haven't addressed for a long time in policy making in this country we haven't got sufficient numbers of institutions or ideas that can build the capacity we need to deal with the long run and i think i was on the other side of this fence on monday when i was giving evidence to the treasury committee um, talking about the problems that we now face uh, with energy and gas supply and the impact on our economy from the war in Ukraine. And one of the things that emerged to me listening to the excellent uh, witnesses sitting, sitting around me is that we face a large number of constraints. We find ourselves penned in by decisions that have been made in the past. So whether they're directly on decisions on inventories or the level of, of infrastructure that we have in the economy, we find that time and time again, when these crises emerge, we seem to have limited room for maneuver. And in some sense, I think that is one of the things we'll be investigating even more as the Productivity Commission continues. We move today, uh, after today's session, to aim towards publishing a paper later this year, summarizing what we've found so far, as well as drawing upon the insights from the policymakers that we'll have um, this afternoon. So I, I think we'll, I'd like to move on to the main part of the um, session now, if I can. Um, and what I'd like to do is ask um, Kitty Asha first, perhaps, to briefly introduce herself and give us five minutes um, as an opening uh, shot across the bows. And then I'll ask Jesse Norman to do the same. And then we'll move on to the first direct set of questions that we put by Stephen Millard on the progress on productivity. So, Kitty, may I turn to you first? Thank you, Jesuit. And it's um, an absolute humbling pleasure to be invited uh, to your session today. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, by way of introduction, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. My career has kind of uh, meandered between sort of politics, policy, economic policy and uh, sort of more dry economics, but I've never been an academic, so I'm humbled by the other people on this call, certainly. Um, I started off as a macro forecaster, uh, worked at the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, looking at the, uh, the last devaluation uh, of the ruble. <laughs> and um, I then had a fairly standard sort of young Turk uh, political career. I was a, a councillor in Lambeth and a special advisor to the then Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, uh, Patricia Hewitt, 20 years ago now, 
Um, and then uh, age of 34, I became the MP for Burnley in East Lancashire, um, was in Parliament for one term, including in the, tre in the Treasury for the financial crisis uh, and in the Department for Work and Pensions in the subsequent uh, recession. Decided to step down in 2010 for personal reasons. Had a nice uh, decade doing consultancy work um, in public policy research. Uh, and I want to draw on some of the sort of conclusions from that in my opening remarks, which is why I thought it was more appropriate to sort of say I was speaking in a personal capacity, but it's 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 still me. Uh, and my current role, as you said, is at the Institute of Directors, where I'm their spokesperson on economic policy, including a big sort of work uh, with with government. So there might be some business angles there that are that are also relevant. I'm sure that's enough about me. I wanted to kind of plant uh, maybe three ideas and you know there's an enormous amount that can be said about this um, and I've chosen my three ideas uh, because I wanted to sort of perhaps talk about some things that I think aren't as uh, prevalent in the policy debate at the moment so I, I simply offer them not because I don't think the other things are important, and I'm sure we'll come on to that, but because in in the in the spirit of being of of, of being useful um, and perhaps thought provoking. So I'm going to focus the first two, in fact, perhaps all of them, um, on the kind of perhaps, might I say, sort of less sexy areas of productivity, um, uh, economic investigation, and that's in the low pay sectors. And I'm not doing that out of any sort of desire to put sort of more sort of poverty and social justice issues onto your agenda. I mean, important though those are, I'm approaching it from a purely economic point of view because I think it's important. Um, and here's the first one. The first is that there are many people working in jobs for which they are uh, uh, overqualified, underemployed. And so if we start to think about the structural reasons for this um, and if it can be fixed, then that perhaps gives us another angle into the relationship between skills and productivity. Because if people aren't fully deploying their skills, uh, then obviously there is a direct link to macroeconomic levels of productivity. And I, I've done a lot of work uh, when I was in consultancy uh, with the with the with the retail sector. In fact, I think probably my path slightly crossed with Jesse with some work I did for the um, uh, for John Lewis uh, some time ago. Um, so. Uh, so here's kind of point one. Um, it, if you ask people if they're overqualified for their job, uh, around half of those currently working in retail say that they are. So that then begs the question, why are they doing work for which they believe they're overqualified? Why are they doing low paid work when they feel they could be contributing more economically? And if you ask them, there's one of two reasons. Either they're just passing through, so they might be at college, and that's fine. Or it is that they're choosing that type of work because of other things going on in their lives. And very typically it would be because they want to work near to where they live, or they want work that is extremely flexible in terms of hours. And so if you want to fully use this capacity in the economy, to a greater extent and therefore drive up productivity, we need to sort of get underneath what it is that can, that can free those people. Now, the move to remote and flexible working is very, very exciting, but I think there are probably areas that we, that we should also talk about in terms of enabling progression while people are still uh, working part-time, part-time promotion, which is missing pretty much from the policy debate at the moment. I'll just skate over these uh, at a very high level to start with. Um, item, uh, idea number two, is what about those people who are not um, actually uh, underemployed, but with appropriate training and reskilling could uh, contribute more to the economy? So they need to retrain or upskill. And this is a related idea to the first one. What, what if your life already is sufficiently complicated that you cannot find the time to do so? So perhaps all of your working hours, uh, or sorry, all of your available time is spent living hand to mouth, perhaps in a low paid job, perhaps with training, you would be able to get a higher paid job. Uh, and if that happened in aggregate, that would have an economic effect. Um, so the time to retrain seems to be something that's not really in the skills and productivity productivity debate sufficiently at the moment. Um, and I think the policy solutions that we can come on to uh, immediately lend us towards uh, what is the role of the employer in upskilling their staff? And what if that means that actually they need to change 
jobs in order to fulfill their their potential what is the role of the employer for an individual who doesn't who who can not only move up but should also move out and it's in our national economic interest uh, for that to happen now the trade union movement has long known this with their you know their sort of trade union sort of learning on the shop floor idea that's very mid 20th century and now in a in a much more disaggregated economy we should think what the, what what the solutions there are and finally, the third idea, um, and this is perhaps more related to my uh, current role, is what is the theory of change about addressing, uh, raising productivity in those firms that are coasting quite happily and their founders and boards and managers are perfectly happy with their performance, but actually they could achieve far more. And I don't think this is... Yeah, I think we're beginning to touch on this in policy circles, but I don't think the answer to that is fully understood. And I think it's probably uh, a key question uh, going forwards. Um, so, you know, what is it that turns a, a, a moderately well-performing SME into a world-leading world SME? And does it matter if they don't want to change? And is that the stumbling block or is it access to uh, some type of expertise? Um, so I kind of plant that question as, as a as a, as a key one for us to consider uh, as well. I think that what those three questions perhaps have in common is that it's about underperformance um, in a very human way, uh, where human decisions are very much playing a part. So perhaps it's slightly different from the, the, the typical way of approaching these questions, which tend to be uh, more about technology and clusters and uh, hub and spoke uh, uh, regional infrastructure. Uh, and competition policy, all of which I think are, you know, and um, technical skills at the FE level, all of which are absolutely crucial. But I think the perhaps the, the key to a kind of step change uh, in thinking about productivity is probably about the individual human choices and the complex lives in which they in which they live. So it's more of a, uh, a the, about the institutional structure of our economy perhaps and what's that and what that is like in the early 21st century and whether there is something that we can shift to that that, that will lead to uh, faster productivity improvements because we're using our skills more effectively particularly you know below the median I would say that's what I want to say by way of introduction we're looking forward to the conversation thank you very much Kitty uh, incredibly interesting uh, set of opening insights which I'm we could respond to but I think we'll, we'll just let them uh, muster for a while, but I, I think very much a people-based explanation there from Kitty rather than uh, a place one, and I'd be interested to, um, to follow up a little bit later on, but I know colleagues are, are eager to do so as well. Jesse, good afternoon. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jagjit, and thank you, commissioners and Nisa, for this very interesting and provocative exercise. Uh, let me say a couple of things. I, I should declare an interest. I'm a governor of Nisa, have been for a long time, and uh, a very wonderful institution it is too. So I have a, in a sense, a foot in both camps. Uh, in terms of my own background, I'm not an economist. I have no formal training in economics. I've written quite a lot about the philosophy of economics and the foundations of economics. Um, written a book about Adam Smith a few years ago, which was designed to show his continuing relevance to a whole bunch of contemporary issues, as well as to get straight on what he actually thought and the breadth and um, depth of his insights. And I spent quite a long time on the Treasury Committee as a backbench parliamentarian, as well as later moving into the government. And in the government, I was uh, energy minister and then roads minister and then financial secretary. So uh, you've got a very interesting array of sections. And uh, if I may, perhaps I can just throw a few provocative, hopefully provocative thoughts, just to kind of um, give an indication of where my own thinking for what it's worth is going. And then we can pick up. I, I can't promise to have sensible answers to all of the areas you want to probe, but hopefully I'll have more interesting things to say about areas you haven't thought of. And my perspective is going to be to look at this, not really from an ideological perspective, but from what you might call the perspective of a pragmatic and a, a reform-minded small c conservative. And I suppose the, the first thing to say is that it's just to kind of remind ourselves of where we are and what I mean by that is 
Um, look, we're in a situation where the public finances are extremely weak. They're about to get severely tested again. The burden of taxation is at uh, a 50 or possibly 70 year high. The rate of inflation seems to be rising and the kind of 1970s prospect of stagflation is potentially staring us in the face. And I think that's quite important to realize that and to kind of bear that in mind when things about productivity. Uh, we've also, of course, got I don't think we've really come to terms with understanding what the long term effects of COVID are. I mean, the effects of loss of labor, the effects of um, working from home in moving people, moving, moving, as it were, the balance of uh, labor productivity into more educated roles and away from less educated um, worries about the cutting off of progression from lower skill to higher skill jobs and, and several things I'm going to say about skills will overlap I think quite closely with what Kitty's just been saying. I also don't think we've remotely and I thank Nisa for the initial research it's done in this area but I don't think we've remotely come to terms with thinking about what the impact of the situation in Ukraine is and I don't just mean the proximate trade and economic hit which of course will be very heavily felt in you know food supply chains both going in and coming out of that country and, and energy we know but also what you might call what what the structural long-term effects will be of significantly raising costs because of the need for security in key sectors energy food fuel etc and i explored this a little bit when i was at the treasury in in terms of the question of how much provision could be made against a future pandemic and i think it's a very difficult question for public policy to answer because uh, money put away now is money that isn't being spent and in democracy people uh, want to often to spend up to the limits of the exchequer and the treasury's job is to try to maintain some form of budget constraint in the face of those pressures so to say well we're going to put aside some money which is as it were a discretionary pot against a future catastrophe in order to provide additional resilience is very difficult and and my view is that you know the appetite uh, over a succession of administrations to do that is roughly zero and you saw it in the 1980s and the way we treated the capital receipts from north uh you know oil and gas north sea uh we saw it in the way we treated the capital receipts from the sale of 3g licenses and you know the contrast with other economies the most famous one obviously is norway uh which decided to take the capital balance invest it protect it and keep it for a rainy day the result of which is it of course, Norway is one of the richest countries in the world, is, I think, quite manifest and quite serious. And that's one of the reasons why, historically, over time, I've promoted the idea of some form of a national assets fund. That has the other attractive merit, which I think is sometimes ignored, that uh, it allows us to address a, a desperate conundrum in the national accounts, which is that we score debt, but we don't score asset creation created by that debt. And therefore, we only ever really look at one side of the balance sheet. And that I think introduces a destabilizing effect into policy. So I, I don't think we really understand or have thought enough about COVID. I don't think we've th understood or thought enough about Ukraine. Uh, and I, I, without being too bleak about it, I don't think we've any got anywhere near a sensible hold on the problem of productivity. And it might just remind ourselves that weak productivity has been a problem in this country for 150 years. And um, I don't think we really understand it either in the in the macro level and i was very interested to read some of the contributions made into the productivity commission so far in particular the one from the ons uh, which attempts to quantify and to gauge the way in which productivity has been quantified at the national accounts over the last few years and i don't think we understand it really at a at a macro level i was sitting think we understand at a micro level i mean i mean why is it the case that low skilled jobs in this country uh, seem to be so much less productive than their parallel jobs in uh, Germany and the USA and uh, how can we make sure that uh, even if there aren't ways specifically of improving the skills in those jobs those jobs because they may not need those skills that progression is available to really drive people uh, uh, or to give people the opportunity to to drive themselves into higher pay and and more prosperous work so um, that's, I suppose, a, an initial set of challenges. Let me just say a couple of other things, if I may, which in a way pick up on a couple of points that Kitty made. Um, the first is, if you 
you go back to the 1970s, another period of potential actual stagflation rather than potential. And one of the things that's interesting, and I think, again, it's picked up by some of the evidence that you've already received, is the what you might call large business intensity uh, within sectors, which seems to be lower now because of desegregation in uh, sectors and industrial supply chains uh, than it was then. So you don't get the, the agglomeration of large businesses in sectors. And since those businesses tend to be responsible for the bulk of uh, training within business, um, I think that creates a, a destabilizing dynamic with regard to how skills are actually going to be created and developed. If you think about leveling up, it's overwhelmingly, I mean, it seems to me it's much more correlated, the evidence suggests, with skills uh, than, for example, with uh, infrastructure. And that uh, isn't helpful. And those skills aren't just uh, in STEM skills, although there's an enormous shortfall there, they are also in basic in numeracy and the like. And the question of how you get skills into disaggregated sectors, such as, for example, the creative industries, is, a, is I think, rather a difficult one. And I noticed that uh, Peter Bazalgette has done some work on this with the idea of clusters in creative industries. That may be a way of doing it, but those clusters would have to show that they were, in some sense, more than the sum of their parts from the point of view of training and skills development uh, in order to justify certainly any public support for them. Uh, but of course, there is a lot that potentially can be done without that. Uh, I've got plenty of other thoughts on this, but let me just put that out there in terms of the challenges that face um, a, a productivity commission, not just in terms of how to think of uh, productivity now, but what productivity is and how to measure it, the scale of those challenges, and then the centrality of skills and the importance of routes through from low skills to high skills and supporting that. Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, a challenge, I, I think. Um, I think what we're learning from this exercise is that pro a synonym for productivity is, is, is in some sense, na the national, um, national prosperity, the position of the country and where it sits. So almost everything, in a sense, contributes to productivity and that's why we have to think of this commission as being multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary to try and understand the links between initial conditions structural issues that might be infrastructure things that will take a long time to change and things that we can do now that might have an immediate impact but it does add up to a very large problem the country's faced as jesse has said for a long long time i remember being lectured on the problems of uk productivity in the 1980s when I was an undergraduate, isn't it? and it seems to be we're saying the same thing to our undergraduates these days. It doesn't ever seem to change. Um, and that does suggest that it, it is a problem across the country, the institutions, the way we're governed, the decisions that we make, it is not going to be in any way something solved by a single single bullet, which perhaps at the moment is an unfortunate phrase. I have to think of a better one. Um, Stephen, can I turn to you now? Um, Stephen Millard is Deputy Director of the National Institute, uh, particular uh, emphasis on macroeconomics, modelling and forecasting. He's uh, joined us relatively recently after an illustrious and long career at the Bank of England. Uh, Stephen, uh, thank you for joining us for your first session on the Productivity Commission. You're going to ask um, Jesse and Kitty questions on the progress on productivity so far. Stephen, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Jack Jett. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I've been, uh, I've been asked to start us off uh, by basically answering all the questions that, that Jesse just raised. Um, so firing, firing the back at him more or less. Um, so that's the question, where are we now in terms of uh, progress on productivity and what progress uh, do you think is likely? Jesse, if you wanna start on that and, and then maybe Kitty, you can follow up. Sure, well, well thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephen, that's a very cruel trick to, um put my um, coruscating interrogation back to myself. Um, so uh, uh, two or three things. Uh, I hope we'll come on to the UK Infrastructure Bank later on, because I think that's an important part of the longer term story. Um, I, I, my own view is that there are, I, I'm not really in position, I'm not sufficiently expert to give you a properly comprehensive answer to the question of what progress we're making. But let me pick on something where I think we are making progress. And uh, because I, it's something I'm directly involved with. And, and this is um, in uh, technical and 
uh, engineering education. So we're trying to set up in Hereford, a, in fact, we are setting up and have set up a, a thing called the New Model Institute for Technology and Engineering in Hereford. And the reason why I think that's interesting is because it is <laughs> a, a different way of teaching people um, STEM skills and a way that's never been done in this country before. It's taken from the best international models in America and in Europe. And the reason I like that is because it, what goes with it is a much more inclusive conception of how you recruit young people into skills-based higher education, that being a phrase rather different from higher education. I mean, I, I, I you know, I was the, the, the guilty, the victim of a, a thoroughly non-skills-based higher education. And so I'm, uh, I emerged with no skills, but um, th these young people, of which we now have 40 uh, in the first course, are learning in a remarkably new and interesting way. And I won't go into the details, but it has been set up self-consciously as a model drawing on the best international examples, which can then be replicated. And the reason why I think the government's put in the levelling up white paper, which it has done, and has been supporting it for a number of years, NMIT as it's called, is because there is now an opportunity to roll out this kind of specialist technical and engineering education around the country. And you can do it in small cities and towns. Now, the excellent summary from the center of cities given to you shows how dependent we are on improved productivity in cities. And of course, it's absolutely right, as the people have done, to focus on large cities. I also think there's a story to be told about small cities. And uh, I think of this as the small modular nuclear reactor of higher education, because you just drop it in somewhere. And then you, for, a def, for a defined amount of money, they cost about 35 million pounds a pop plus the local contribution and development. And that I think then becomes a tremendous powerhouse. Now, if you look at Lincoln, Lincoln is a university, didn't exist in 1907, um, was grafted onto the old Humberside College, took about 10 years to get going, and then has basically gone through the sky since 2010. And the result is that it generates hundreds of millions of pounds a year to the national accounts in a part of the world that was formerly regarded as, you know, um, rural and distant and underskilled, just put in a medical school. So I think that future and all of the aspects that go with it of technical education and degree apprenticeships when the government and businesses get those right, which it is still, and they are still quite a long way from doing. Uh, and I think alongside that, the emphasis on uh, lifelong learning that brings people back into uh, uh, the workforce after a period of education. I think all that with a place-based economic strategy, and I, uh, I'd like to touch on that later on in the discussion, is I think potentially quite an interesting development from a productivity standpoint. But I do not think that any single measure is going to make, we can talk about tax measures that cut against productivity, but I don't think any single measure is going to move the dial significantly more than this enormous change of culture that goes with entrepreneurship, education and skills of the kind I've described. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Kitty, you mentioned specifically sort of the lower paid sector. So I was wondering if, if you could uh, give us your thoughts on what progress has been made in raising productivity in lower paid sectors. I mean, how much have they contributed to the weak performance of UK productivity um, and uh, are they improving? Very, very interesting question. I agree with pretty much everything Jessica said about uh, skills and entrepreneurial culture, by the way, but we can we can we can come back to that. Um, I mean, I th the kind of obvious answer to your question is that if there's growth in the lower paid sectors, given the economic link between pay and productivity, that brings down <laughs> average productivity. And I think that's that's probably quite a lot of the story of the last decade or so, certainly up to the pandemic. Um, so the, the way I'd kind of characterise this, the situation is, well, uh, the, you know, the, the productivity paradox we've been talking about since about 2010 um, is that there seems to be a lower trend of productivity growth. And this is worrying because productivity is so intrinsically linked to the long term ability of the country to generate uh, wealth. Um, so I think the important question is what is actually happening that's 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 driving that change in the data, and there seem to be sort of two main things. One is less of a contribution from the very high productivity uh, in the financial services sector. Uh, now, mathematically, 
that's giving us a lower answer, but actually in terms of the national interest, it's not necessarily a problem. If you think that that's because the banks are better capitalized, uh, are making less risky uh, decisions, and perhaps have been making super normal profits in the run up to the financial crisis, you, you know, that's that's definitely an improvement that those things are, are, are not happening. Um, and the, the, the other reason is that our economy has continued to grow. And so as more people have more disposable income, they are choosing to spend that in the service sector. Uh, and while some of them may be spending it on expensive lawyers and accountants, a lot of people are spending it uh, on uh, retail and hospitality, which of course is increasing demand there, which lowers uh, the average rate of productivity uh, growth. Is that bad? Is that good? Well, fundamentally GDP is rising, which takes me to sort of another point. And Jajit sort of referred to this when he said what we're talking about really is prosperity. I think when we're discussing productivity, we need to be absolutely clear as to what good is. Are we really talking about raising GDP or are we purely focused on productivity? Because of course, it's perfectly possible to have an economy where there's one incredibly productive person <laughs> and uh, a lot of very, very low productivity uh, people that has the same GDP as an economy where that's kind of switched around. And I, I like to think of G GDP as sort of productivity times employment. It's, it's kind of ma mathematically true. And, and, and so actually you, you want both of those things to be raised um, to get greater prosperity. And what perhaps we've seen since, since 2010 is an extraordinarily good performance in terms of employment. And, you know, pretty mediocre but still just positive performance in terms of productivity and so overall GDP has been all right um, up until the pandemic um, so we need to be sort of I think kind of clear about what it is that we're that, that, that we're worrying about now of course if we want to be able to continue to grow we, we can't keep relying on just the you know sort of being cheaper and cheaper and cheaper we have to go up the value chain so so it it, it does matter but um, uh, we just need to be quite precise I think about what we're really Kind of worrying about. I think I think I think that's got to be right. And with, without wishing to put words in into your mouth at all, um, the issue you were talking about earlier in terms of people uh, being overqualified and underemployed. I mean, part of prosperity is having jobs. But then once we've sorted that problem out, and we seem to have at the moment, it's about having fulfilling jobs. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I, th I think one of the, you know, if you're asking what are the policy questions, I think that uh, is a priority policy question is, is how, um, how people move up, up and through. Uh, and if we can raise the productivity of those jobs, great. But if we can't, there's something that we can't do even by raising, you know, the minimum wage, so, you know, to sort of force uh, the causality the, the other way around, then the question very much becomes how does each individual realise their potential, because that too in aggregate will have an economic effect. Um, and so it's it's up and out as well as up uh, that, that we need to be thinking about. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's, there's, there's quite a lot that uh, can be done in terms of the responsibility that uh, employers uh, have and the incentives that they have to to keep thinking about upskilling and, and reskilling um, and where the market failure is there and where the government therefore needs to um, get involved in order to meet skills shortages. Exactly. I think we might come to possible solutions later on in the session. So uh, I'm just going to stick with where we are for the minute. And Jesse, you mentioned the national infrastructure uh, bank. Um, do you think the mandate of the National Infrastructure Bank is adequate? And uh, do you think the funding is adequate? Well, um, thanks for the question, uh, Stephen. I, I look, I, I'm, I'm part of pre on this, right? I set it up. So I would be very enthusiastic about it. And you'll have to uh, take all that with a pinch of salt. Let, let's look at what it's what's happened so far. And then we can look at the questions you raised. So the first is it didn't exist. Um, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, it's uh it's taken about seven months to set up in 2021 it opened in september and it has world-class leadership so john flint was the former chief executive of hsbc understands banking as well as anyone on the planet and chris grigg the chair was a you know chief executive of british land 
partner at Goldman Sachs. So it's a very, very high quality leadership. And by the way, this has not by any means always been the case with infrastructure banks around the world. Um, you know, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank went through a couple of uh, chairs and a couple of chief executives before it got something that was settled. And so just to have got that away in a short period of time is good. Now, has it got enough firepower? Well, let's just see. It's got uh, you know, 22 billion of capital in total, of which 10 billion is in form of guarantees. And uh, we'll have to see how long it lasts and how well it does with that. I think it's quite important to have a demarcated amount of capital. We want it to be earning its crust. We want it to be thinking about how it redeploys capital. Um, in terms of its mandate, uh, it has two mandates. The first is, uh, as it were, leveling up. And the second is net zero. And of course, there is a potential conflict between those because some businesses, some industries, some investments may be very much about, uh, you know, pouring concrete and others may be uh, and therefore may, may cut in favor of leveling up, but against net zero. And uh, it is for it to work out that um, potential implicit tension. I don't think we should let it distract us too much. It's useful to have two uh, goals. A degree of creative conflict isn't a bad thing. There are plenty of things that fall into either one or other without raising any tensions. And there are plenty of things you can do to projects which do fall in that, as it were, middle area, for example, using green concrete and the like which is, uh, I think, useful. Now, where I think it's quite interesting is, is twofold. And I'm not sure anyone's quite picked this up in the commentary, but so it might be worth just mentioning it. The first is that an awful lot, we tend to think in kind of static economic terms uh, about market failures. And Kitty's rightly mentioned that, and obviously it's an important function historically of government to intervene. But actually, an awful lot of what the bank is doing is at the other end. It's in thinking about <clears throat> emerging markets, the markets not of now, but of the future, markets which haven't come into existence because of the structure of entry costs uh, or the immaturity of technology or um, similar uh, occurrences. And so developing some quite deep sector expertise in some of those key areas, an example would be hydrogen, for example, another example would be um, you know, different forms of energy storage technologies, those kinds of things. We can be rationally certain that they're going to be a very important part of the future economic policy of this country. They may well be part of an enormous part of a, a future sectoral based green international leadership that we could exercise. Uh, but we need to have people actually thinking in a very long term way an inclusive way across uh, across sectors and across time about how to develop that. And of course, we need people who are sufficiently expert for it to be worthwhile for smaller businesses that are innovators, that are insurgents, to talk to them and actually to learn something, So, which isn't always the case. Uh, and then the final thing I would say is that it's tremendously useful for government to have a pool of experts in a given area who can then, particularly with the imprimatur of the Treasury, um, but without, as it were, too much direct oversight, uh, because that then allows the bank to draw on and to draw together all the strands of expertise across government in order to address issues and start to think about industry structure and industrial policy. I hope we'll be coming on to industrial strategy later on. But that seems to me to be that convening effect within government and the presenting of a single face to an industry or to a potential innovating company is, I think, very valuable. And if you can get really high quality people uh, and uh, uh, in that group, which they appear to be doing, which is very exciting, then I think that's potentially rather transformational. And of course, the other thing is it's in Leeds, which is great because it, you know the more we can put you know world class institutions developing their own ethos, drawing from their own uh, regions and areas, and channeling culture and history uh, into their own practice, as well as frankly a ton of talent out there, um, the better I think. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I've got just one more question and I'll um, address it towards Kitty uh, to even things up in terms of the questions and answers. But it's basically, how do, how do you think the pandemic itself has affected productivity? Has it, has it created opportunities? Uh, has it um, made things even worse? What, what are your views on, on the pandemic? Uh, in terms of the, uh, the the data, I can only sort of cite the ONS work in this area, which I'm sure everyone on this call uh, has seen, which showed very understandably that, um, uh, and certainly in terms of output per hour worked, when you take out those on furlough who are more likely to be in uh, 
lower paid sectors, then productivity rose mathematically um, and is now falling back roughly to, to, to where it was previously. But I don't think there's anything particularly interesting really in that, um, except a sort of blip in the data. In terms of, is there an opportunity structurally going forwards? Well, it depends on what we think has changed. I, I was very struck in the labour force data uh, that showed although economic inactivity has risen, um, which is concerning for GDP anyway, uh, there was a, a big fall in the number of people who said that they were inactive, uh, so weren't in the labour market because they were, quote, looking after family or home. And so it seems to be that it is... Uh, I presume that's due to the ability to work remotely. Um, so that potentially uh, opens up more opportunity to more people who are perfectly able to work and want to work, um, which could have an economic effect going forward and, and could partially uh, address the, the problem of underemployment amongst people who want to work uh, locally. And so we're taking very low paid jobs in order to be able to do that. So that's potentially, I think, quite exciting. The other exciting thing is the enforced digitization uh, of SMEs in particular. And if you'll permit me a very quick anecdote, I was working at the think tank Demos when the pandemic hit and we just landed a very nice big project to, to do a public policy research piece of work, perhaps in competition with NISA, I don't know, but we managed to get it um, on uh, uh, how to digitize SMEs. <laughs> and um, because as a solution to the productivity uh, paradox, uh, and what, what were the uh, mechanisms by which you could persuade businesses to, for example, adopt cloud computing software when they'd never heard of it and so on. Unfortunately, we lost the contract. We're a victim of the pandemic. The project got scrapped because everybody was being forced to do it anyway. Um, but I was on it long enough to have read all the literature about the relationship between uh, economic productivity and digitization and discovered there's a very strong, clear <laughs> correlation. And so to the extent that a whole load of firms have been forced to adopt it, there is potentially quite an exciting sort of medium term outcome in that once we all settled down they will actually be working far more efficiently uh third one quickly just as i remember uh, a sort of purist uh, would say that any kind of disruption leads to a better uh, configuration of economic resources the sort of um Schumpeter argument um creative destruction uh, and i think there's probably been quite a good example of that from the pandemic and you can probably see it in the amount of m a activity and sort of big decisions that a lot of firms are making at the moment as to what their long-term future is so probably too early to provide empirical data but there seems to be some evidence that there's been some deeper thinking about how a lot of organizations should be reconfigured that's come about as a result of the pandemic that might lead to uh, a long-term very positive effect on productivity as, as they're more as you know the supply of pr <laughs> production is, is is more efficiently configured going through going forwards. Thank you. Well, I'd love to continue the conversation, but I'm out of time, so I'm, I'm going to hand back to the chair. Thank you very much, um, Stephen. Um, um, to say there's never, we'll never run out of time. We will continue these dialogues uh, as well uh, with Kitty and Jesse over time. This is, uh, I think, a start of the conversation rather than anything that will be completed today. Just before I turn over to Professor Eileen Harkin Jones, I wonder if I could just put two points of information uh, on. on uh, Matt Pantelli is to my right as the head of policy at TPI that I'm sure we'll be returned to this question at some point in the future. And just to say, Jesse, um, Adrian and myself um, did meet colleagues at the um, UK Investment Bank last week in, in Leeds, where, as you said, there's cultural history and, uh, and uh, skills uh, there. We had a very interesting time trying to understand what they're about. And I, I think it is promising. Um, I think we have the same question in our mind that you suggested, is it going to be large enough? to deal with the genuine infrastructure gaps that we see around the country? Will it be able to operate nimbly enough into the more risky areas? And that's an interesting question I think we want to be thinking about. Not today, but I think that came out of the conversation last week and we're also reflected by the remarks that you just made. We, we're glad to see it, but we ask the questions of whether it is large enough um, to deal with the gaps that we have and in terms of size as the kind of development banks that we see elsewhere in the world. And that's an open question, I think, at the moment. On the question of disruption, Kitty, it's something that's come up quite a lot. And, and where I agree with the disruption, you know, can lead to things being thrown in the air and, and, and ending up in a better position than they did before. Uh, actually, that may not happen if, if structures end up constraining possibilities for people. And it, so initial conditions also matter. And, and in the sense in which I just want to point to some of the work that we're seeing um, from 
um, regional economists and others assessing that unless the structure of the economy changes, what will happen is we'll generally snap back to what we had in the past. It's not going to necessarily lead to change. So disruption by itself doesn't necessarily lead to um, you know, allocation of resources and skills into more productive areas uh, unless other market imperfections or institutions or opportunities are made available to offset genuine market, genuine market uh, failures, which we think are out there. So I, I think it's more a question of how we affect that change. Maybe that goes back to your question on the theory of change as well. But I just wanted to put those points in so we don't we don't forget about them. Um, Professor Eileen Harkin is delighted that you're not only a commissioner but taking the next round of questions with everyone. Um, Eileen Harkin Jones is a is a professor of engineering, uh, and uh, therefore we're doubly delighted um, to bring in not only someone from Northern Ireland but also someone who's bringing a different perspective to us uh, common garden economists. Eileen. <laughs> You might regret that. <laughs> I, I, I regret a lot of things, but I don't think I'll regret that very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to start with a general question, and then I have some more specific questions on skills and if there's time on, on the levelling up agenda. And the questions are to both witnesses. So the first one is, um, which two policy areas do you think we need to focus on to deliver the greatest long-term impact on UK productivity. So we've got lots of short-term initiatives floating about, but I'm really interested in the long-term. So if you were to choose two areas, which, which two areas would have the biggest impact, do you think? And maybe Kitty would like to start. Great question. Um, I think I would focus uh, on lifelong learning as the first one. Uh, I've touched on this already. Uh, I think incentives for workplace reskilling and upskilling, I would do it very simply through the tax system um, because I think that's what business responds to, uh, would make it far harder for people and organizations to get stuck. Uh, I think they would think more um, I'm just, I was just hoping you would go to Jesse uh, <laughs> so that I could have time to be absolutely clear uh, about what uh, my second one is. But I think certainly in the mix <laughs> uh, would be, I'm not quite sure what the policy is, um, but I think we need to think about what the policies is where the outcome uh, would be being able to be promoted when you work shorter hours, part-time promotion, because I think that would free up a lot of talent. So whether that's going to happen anyway through this sort of cultural shift to flexible working, but that seems to be more about location, which is also incredibly positive. Um, but I think that, you know, a, a policy focus on uh, uh, part time promotion would would be huge. So just very quickly, um, Kitty, you, you mentioned that so we have a lot of people who are overqualified for the roles in which they find themselves now. I mean, could it be that we have just too many people studying degree courses that are just not required in the economy at the minute? Um, and uh, we need to take a look at that as well. Well, I, I know the government is sort of considering how much financial support it gives to some degree courses over others. I, I think there are a lot of sexually softer benefits from uh, the experience of going to university yeah. and um, the, the network effects of that, such that I wouldn't want to sort of give a, a sort of blunt answer to your, mm. to your question. But perhaps another way of answering it is that... Um, the, the, the needs to be, and the government is inching towards this, but I don't think they've really understood the implications of the inches they've already made. There the, the needs to be a sort of consensus view as to what the skills shortages of the future is, a future are, are is are, um, in, in a sort of post-Brexit, post-pandemic world. And the government has already sort of started in this direction because it's through its lifelong learning guarantee at level three, it has actually published a list of courses that it thinks are eligible. And of course, we've got the um, migration advisory people publishing the list of areas which will give short-term visas for and if that was properly done in a kind of you know independent technocratic way you know these are the areas that we really need skills for in the future then I think a lot starts to flow from that because that starts to justify 
taxpayer intervention, public intervention in order to try and get as many people onto those particular um, skills tracks as possible. And then you can, and then that starts to justify should employers be prioritizing that, should the tax system prioritize that and so on. Um, so whether that then means that degree courses should be more uh, focused on the skills shortages of the future as technocratically determined um, you know perhaps that becomes more of a case for it then but I think you know when you're that young and just starting out there are other massive benefits from a degree education as well as the specific skills notwithstanding Jesse's point that he says he's got no skills at all. <laughs> well uh, moving on to Jesse thank you um, Kitty uh, Jesse your two policy areas that you might focus on uh, yes, well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And just to follow up, uh, I, I think there are two things that I would say. The first is that I, I think we should be a bit more, you know, listen, I, I'm a philosopher by training. I, I think we should become a bit more self-conscious about, self-aware about areas in which policy is having a negative effect on productivity already. And I don't have a policy prescription particularly, but I just point out two of them. Uh, because I think self-awareness is useful and if these reflect political choices let's just be aware of what those choices are because they will be choices whose effect predictably is to reduce productivity so so one of them is at the moment the state gives uh, people a very big tax incentive to retire at 55 and um, you know that takes an enormous amount of highly productive capable well-skilled energetic labor uh, potentially at least out of the market and it may of course be redeployed in different ways but it's hard to think that doesn't have a negative effect on productivity and it kind of goes to the point i was making earlier i mean uh you know the 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 english view of a life has often been one in which broadly speaking people work for a period of time and then they um sink back um exhausted after all their toil and uh, you know, <clears throat> move to the countryside or try and find a, a way of life which is not about work. And I wouldn't criticise anyone's choices in that regard at all. But it does link to, you know, Martin Wiener and the decline of the industrial spirit, because, you know, those people might well be very happily uh, involved, engaged, healthier, fitter, uh, longer at work. And, uh, you know, we give them a tax incentive not to be. So that's a first point. The second point is that we, our tax system also reflects um, a, a strong historic preference in favour of small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have that, for example, in the uh, VAT registration threshold that we have of 80 or 5 or 1,000 quid, I think it is, um, from memory. And, uh, you know, that, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad idea or a good idea. I'm just saying, let's be aware that that may have the effect of cutting against productivity. I mean, small businesses tend to be less good at training people. So it may have a skills effect. It may have a productivity effect because you're privileging them relative to slightly larger businesses in the tax system. So let's be aware of what uh, our, uh, uh, our existing policy framework does. Um, that's, as it were, on one side. On the other side, I've, well, I've mentioned, obviously, um, uh, Enmite in Hereford and the a modular form of new technical education. I think that's a terribly important long-term development for the country, not just for the marches and 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 my own uh, part of the world. Um, I suppose if I was looking for a wider, an even wider way of trying to move the dial, uh, and this picks up something Kitty said, but it also owes a lot to Tim Loinig. Uh, uh, you know, we were looking very hard at, at how to continue to train and upskill and maintain the skills of of women in the workforce. Uh, and one suggestion that Tim has made is that all jobs should be advertised uh, as full time or part time or job share and that that would have an effect. Uh, there would be, of course, be quite a lot of uh, pushback, but that that would have the effect of just flagging to many very skilled and able women who face lots of other life choices that those jobs are available to them. Uh, working together uh, individually or in combination. And I think that might be a tremendously important move to begin the process of moving the dial upwards in productivity, because that's an incredible underutilized resource in our political economy as we currently have it. Okay, thank you. I'm just uh, 
reflecting on, on, on what you, you mentioned there about some of the policies maybe that haven't been so successful. So in terms of having successful policies, what measures can be taken by government policy teams to ensure effective design and implementation of, say, for example, education and skills policy? And I'm thinking of now, I don't know how these things work, but for example, is it common practice for cross-departmental teams to work together on policy development? Do they engage external stakeholders very early on in the process so that they get the design right at the very beginning and not leave it until you, you have a consultation process at the very end where you've put in so much work up front that then may be not very useful so you know what, what measures do, I mean, do policy development teams work like this are they are do they work in a cross departmental fashion and if not why not because i'd imagine that there's a really big need for that to happen so kitty would you like to yeah uh i my experience of government is that it varies sometimes that's it's all done very well and sometimes it's not um, very well, I would say, would be to put a massive, or maybe I would say this as a public policy research professional, but would be put a, a, a massive amount of uh, effort into co collecting the evidence as to what works. And there are many good examples of that. Indeed, there are what work centres all over the country, as you know, and, and NISA does a huge amount of work in this regard uh, as well. Uh, a, a lot of that is, is cross-departmental. Perhaps what isn't uh, as good as it should be is the way that the impact assessment process is embedded into policy making, I would say. Now, I'm 12 years out of government, um, but my memory is it often was a sort of slightly kind of parallel track and something that had to get signed off at the end before the thing was published, uh, rather than actually feeding properly into the uh, decision making process. Um, so I don't know if that's improved, uh, but uh, that would be worth uh, looking at. Uh, you know, and a classic example of how not to do it was the decision to raise national insurance, which not only avoided a finance bill unusually, but uh, had an impact assessment that, 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 that said, we don't know and we haven't done an impact assessment, but we think the effect will be large. Um, so in th that's, um, and because impact assessments have been, I think, legislated for and certainly very embedded that they should exist, mm -hmm. that might be the way into answering your question as to, as to how real really is, is, is that process. Um, but I mean, your, your, your question is very broad and government is very big. And I, I think the, the sort of easy, easy way to, to answer it is that there are good examples of that and bad examples. Okay, thanks, um, Kitty. And uh, Jesse, your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think it is right that, of course, it does vary across government. Uh, I think there's, in a way, we're going to get onto some of these questions when we talk about structure of government uh, mm -hmm. later on. Uh, I think that one of the key questions that government needs to think about is how good are the different departments in working with each other? And to what extent can different departments act as effective clients to the Treasury when thinking about um, strategy and deployment of public money and it's extremely variable is the truth of the matter and uh, you know if we could improve the functioning of parts of um, uh, you know some of our business facing or place facing departments in the way they interact with the treasury or indeed transport I think you would get better outcomes all round. when you think about the when I think about the policy process the the, the obvious area to me which is crying out for uh, investigation is uh, levels of competitiveness within markets. And if you look at America and some of the work that the Furman Commission has did under Obama, you know, we discovered that market, final markups in markets were going up enormously over time. And uh, that, of course, then intersects with an interesting question about how technology is being deployed and whether those markets are competitive. Uh, and of course, there's the further question of how competitive um, the financial markets are. I mean, we're in this interesting paradoxical world where the financial and uh, public and uh, and professional services sectors are generating enormous amounts of uh, growth and potential revenue. It's very far from clear how productive they are. It's very mm -hmm. far from clear. Uh, they, they, it, it appears to be a, there appears to be a lot of rent extraction going on from those businesses. Uh, 
And of course, it's a massive diversion of talent away from, you know, things that people on reflection actually care about, which is cures for cancer, better, better, you know, um, better technology, um, better devices, better products, better, uh, uh, as it were, um, means that support people in their lives and their well-being. So uh, I think that whole question of competitiveness in markets could really do with a thorough review. And of course, with that, I think, goes the question of whether the Competition Markets Authority has the right tools to do the job uh, in areas where it wants to be active and whether it's been given adequate scope to act by government. And I don't think we've really addressed that question uh, enough at the moment. I'm not sure that its remit is necessarily wrong and it's very easy to blame that. I think the question is really whether it has the tools and whether it has the capabilities to discharge the remits it's been given. But we certainly need it to be much more active in terms of ensuring competitiveness in markets. And I would say also probably in consumer protection, although I think that's in some respects more controversial. Thank you very much uh, um, for that contribution, um, Jesse. Um, so I'm going to go back now to sort of to the skills um, uh, agenda and ask you, you know, I think we have a really big problem coming down the track very quickly, and that is where are we going to get the skills to facilitate the needs of the digital economy and the green economy? And we're not going to be able to, you know, train up lots and lots of graduates really, really quickly or apprentices or whatever really, really quickly to meet these needs. So, uh, so we have to think about re-training um, people already in the workforce um, in, a, in an efficient way. So what interventions do you think can government make now to efficiently upskill our workforce to support that economy, the digital economy, which is really going to drive everything and, and the green economy, let's say? And that's to either witness. Shall I, shall I have a go? Um, yeah. Well, it, I think it follows on from, from my previous point. So, I mean, I've got a particular bent on the SME sector. But if at the moment, if you uh, spend, spend your training budget on a, on a member of staff, it is tax deductible if it is for refreshing their current skills. But it's you know, even if you can set it against revenue, it it's, remains uh, a cost, just like any other cost. If you decide to retrain your member of staff into a new digital role or uh, a green skill <laughs> to be their, you know, the in-house green skill advisor or, or whatever, um, then it's not tax deductible. Um, and what's more, once you've actually reskilled them, they are much more likely to be poached by somebody else because they're in a much more uh, desirable, uh, they have much more desirable skill set. So you're going to not want to do that. You're going to want to go to the market and try and find someone. And of course, that's, that's what everyone else is doing uh, as well. And that leads to uh, the shortages. So we think there is a clear case for government intervention there. And what we're calling for is that the super deduction that's been introduced for physical capital for these two years should be extended to human capital, i.e. upskilling and reskilling uh, for the skills shortages areas. Now, hopefully there'll be a sort of sweet spot uh, where that's both in the interest of the company and also in the country, uh, but it also takes away the risk of uh, poaching uh, and uh, that is preventing people from investing in, in, in that uh, area as much at the moment. And also coming back to the sort of theory of change point, um, I don't know how many people on this call have run small businesses. I've only run a very, very, very micro business for only a small number of, of, of years. But um, I think there's a really important question as to what makes businesses sit up and notice if you're trying to achieve change, particularly within the smaller business uh, sector. And I think using the tax system makes a massive difference because everyone's got an accountant and everyone gets told, oh, if you do this, then, then this happens. And so it, um, it, it, if you can find the right intervention that pays back for the economy as a whole, I think it's really effective. And the other point to make is that um, for and, uh, you know, the vast majority of the economy, actually, uh, investment doesn't mean plant and capital. <laughs> it, uh, it actually means softer things because we're mo mainly a service sector economy. That's not to say that um, a plant and machinery isn't, you know, and the manufacturing sector isn't hugely important. It's just that if you if, if you say, are you investing, it might just as well mean skills or taking someone on who's 
um, you know, got a contact book that you need or got the skill set that, that you that, that you need. So I think the government needs to think a bit more about what type of investment is it is it is trying to incentivize. Mm, I've got a very clear ask there. Yeah. Um, well, there's very little point in investing in um, in equipment and in um, digital um, up, upgrading if we don't have the skills to understand the data that we get and what to do with it and what it means. And, you know, there, there's massive potential there. And if we don't do something very quickly, we're going to lose that. We're going to be, fall behind very, very quickly. Um, Jesse, any um, comments to make on that area? Uh, I think um, we've covered it uh, very well. I mean, there is a, uh, you raise a whole series of theoretical questions which we might want to come on to. Uh, I've already mentioned the distorting effects of accounting only one side of the balance sheet, that is the amount of debt taken on, but not the asset created in the context of infrastructure investment. But, you know, there are a similar lack of clarity uh, in government as between what counts as uh, capital and what counts as uh, uh, revenue spend and the, uh, as it were, economic effects of each of them. And of course, you know, we're still slightly, um, you know, in the old days, it was famously true of Gordon Brown that he, that he thought that there was no spending in government, there was only investment. Um, but we still, I'm afraid, lack, um, a, a, I would think, a really nuanced uh, a view within government of what counts as investment versus what counts in spending. And of course, it's when you get to these human capital issues um, that you particularly feel the, the lack of a really sensitive set of thinking about that. And then the other thing I would say, obviously, as I touched on it already, the idea of clusters within some of these highly segregated uh, areas where there is a lot of worry about people just picking some skills up and then hopping somewhere else and a lot of churn. And the question of whether you can bring more, more structure to those the training and the skills available in that sector by thinking in a more cluster type way and i think that it may be very dependent on the individual sectors and the amount of um, coherence they naturally possess as well as the economic incentives but i think that's worth exploring as well well i just come back really really briefly um i think it's important to know that a lot of what a, a lot of the ways that innovation is spread throughout the economy is from individuals moving firms um and so therefore as policymakers, that needs to be people need to be comfortable with that idea um and so therefore the, you know it takes back to the kind of market failure point we, we are all in this together and so, you know if, if one person gets trained in, in in one firm then moves to another the first firm might get grumpy about it but actually the economy as a whole doesn't necessarily new, lose lose out and 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 the, and the individual um might do rather 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 well at, uh, out of it but of course if no one's paying for the initial investment because they're worrying about that movement uh, then we all lose out um so and i think that's actually key to the productivity um yeah. conversation that we're having but there's also the you know the question of you know why does the person feel that they need to leave because they're obviously not happy with their you know situation within the company and i just think the whole area of companies investing in their people needs a huge shift. Um, there's a whole culture shift that needs to occur there about investing in training and wanting to keep your people happy and can I can I make a worried about that. Could I make an even more um, kind of left field point on this, mm -hmm. Eileen? Um we have an economy which is very much the, the public debate about the about the UK economy is very much dominated by a kind of service mentality in particular kind of financialized view of the economy and what's quite interesting is that uh you know we have a situation at the moment where you know many of the top companies just basically try to recruit from oxbridge and the russell group when you get i mean i noticed this because of the way we teach kids in hereford we, we do not require you don't have to have four a stars which might prevent you from getting into you know might not even be adequate to get you into cambridge university what you have to be is smart enough to do the course once you've done that uh, uh, you know, we select on the basis of your resilience, your passion, your creativity, your teamwork. When you get that, you get you are bringing in virtues which automatically make people in a way more dynamic uh, and select for more dynamic. And in some respects, I suspect more long term and more value oriented uh, 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 employees. Now, I only mention that because we don't have to go with a model in which people are constantly asking themselves the question, am I happy now or do I leave immediately? 
you know we can we can build in models in which people are more comfortable about taking longer term bets about their own skills and their own well-being and i think that would be a profound change in the way we think about our own lives and the way we think about the economy mm -hmm. yeah there's a there's a huge area there for for debate in the future and uh, i think that's something we need to start looking at now we should have been looking at it all along but um, just going back to you, you'd mentioned, Jesse, uh, about STEM um, workforce and the need that, you know, that we have a huge shortage in areas, some of the areas like engineering, computer science, um, all of the, a lot of the areas, and mathematics probably, um, although it's, it is quite a popular A-level now, but um, the whole diversity issue is is a key thing that we need to consider because we're ignoring to a large extent half of our population. A lot of um, girls are not interested or for one reason or another, maybe it's not interested, isn't the right word, but they're not doing these so-called, you know, narrow STEM subjects. They're not take, taking them on to degree level or apprenticeship level or what, whatever the level is. And we've had over 20 years of initiatives trying to solve this particular problem. And I've been involved in a lot of them. And the, we haven't moved the dial, basically. It's, it's been very, very, very small changes. So have you any suggestions, either of you, for what we can do now? Yes. To look at this issue. Yes, okay. Well, really thank you. So I, I completely recognise the point you make, and you're absolutely right. And it's made worse by the fact that in many other countries, including direct competitors of this, this country, there are much higher levels of female participation in, in the STEM workforce. And so it's a, it's a standing reproach that that should be the case. And of course, it means the tremendous denial of opportunity to incredible talent pool. Uh, and I, I mean, there are, there are some very obvious things one can do, but, but the, the, the most obvious is to try to work towards a conception of STEM, which is not anti-intellectual about maths, does not demand maths um, for A-level, but is more creative about pushing, about, about giving the technical skills quantitative and statistical skills required to be effective uh, in uh, the degree, because there is some evidence, I think I'm right in saying that young women, you know, who are doing O levels and then thinking about A levels or whatever the equivalents may be, are put off going into those strands and pushed in some respects towards medicine because of a worry that, you know, women aren't allowed to be clever about maths or, um, you know, our culture doesn't come mm -hmm. And that seems to me astonishing and grotesque, but we can help it by not placing unnecessary demands at A-level and retrofitting those things as part of a degree uh, process. Or, or we can go back and find out where that perception of their- I would say, and it, uh, and it. Efficacy uh, and mathematics all, actually happened in the first instance. All, all the above. And, and I mean, uh, we have a wonderful little program in Hereford that I've been involved with called Funky Maths, which is all about demythologizing maths and not allowing that culture of somehow it being cool not to be good at maths to, to emerge because and there's so many awful and rather unpleasant deep cultural reasons why this kind of uh, prejudice appears to have emerged and it's extraordinary. It, yeah, it's an awful, it's an awful shame and an awful waste and something that needs Couldn't to be. I very much agree. Um, Kitty, have you? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very good example of, you, you know, we need really good evidence as to what the problem is <laughs> so that yeah. we're not making sort of, you know, quite high level unsubstantiated presumptions as to as to what the problem is um if, if i had an unlimited research budget and was sitting in government i would want to really explore what's going on for the kids that don't do a level who end up doing apprenticeships at 16 um because i had a look at the gender data there and it is absolutely horrific basically um and it shows that any of the apprenticeships that lead to higher salaries in your 20s and 30s are much more likely to be taken by the boys and the ones that lead to lower salaries are much more likely to be taken by the girls now i did a two-year program in uh, in schools. I did Lucy Kellaway's Now Teach scheme, and that is the limit of my understanding of what goes on in secondary schools, and I don't want to name any names, but it seems to me that careers advice for the non-academic kids is not something that is necessarily prioritised or even properly understood um, uh, by many schools. Uh, yeah. And, you know, what actually, I can't remember who I'm paraphrasing by saying this, but you need to judge the outcome of your society by the non-brilliant, 
actually and what happens to them and so uh, at that moment there is something going on that is really very very disturbing indeed now interestingly the um gender breakdown of those who go into finance apprenticeships is pretty 50 50 so that's quite encouraging but but apart from that the engineering oh, yeah. versus versus care is is finance i find it's so finance and um, accounting areas like that there there's no issue but economics for example is an area where there's also a particularly low level of uptake by by um girls yeah anyway it's a big um, problem there's a big a big issue there um Jada, should i continue on yep. with some questions yep. leveling I, up or do we well i, I said th this is a this is a part of our conversation is going to continue. I, I very much feel um, we're learning a lot from talking to Kitty, Kitty and Jesse. We're not going to exhaust all their insights um, this afternoon. So I think it's a question of coming back to some of the points that have been raised. Certainly in summary, I'm learning that there's a lot of biases. I mean, uh, we might think about what economics tells us and it could tell us that we have an expectation about certain things. And when it's far below or above that, there's a problem that needs to be addressed by policy. And we're learning that in terms of um, firms hiring people, are they looking sufficiently diversely across the whole of the economy in whatever dimension of diversity we want to define, whether it's gender, regional or initial educational level of attainment. We're hearing that there is some sense in which firms are not necessarily going out of the way to collect full information on individuals. They may be going to rules of thumb or past behaviours that may not be offering a broad range of opportunities. And, and, and similarly, in terms of skills development, firms themselves maybe in like what everyone is describing here is a low equilibrium trap in that the externality is, is not being internalized by firms. Firms are just saying to themselves, I'm not going to train people because I'm just going to lose that person, not understanding there's a broader uh, positive benefit to the whole of the economy. And that requires a, either a cultural imperative or policy offset to try and deal with that. Yeah. And then we've also had discussion here about issues to do with competition that I think plague many parts of our industries and, and may well be an important issue for us to address. I think Matt and I and Adrian were just discussing that as a, another area for us to, to think hard about is, is you know, there is a, a thought that monopolistic pra practices help investment and help uh, innovation because there's sufficient capital there to take a risk. But there's another view in certain industries where there is already too mature a level of monopolistic control that, that then stops further progress. So I, I think there's a kind of point on the trade-off that's not clear in, in, in where we sit in every industry, but I think it's something we, we, we need to be thinking about. It's also important now that we, we kind of move on, I think, and allow um, Andy Westwood um, to come in. Actually, Andy Westwood is a great friend of both the Productivity Institute as, as a theme leader in, in, in the government's institution, but also um, of, of NISA. He's a professor of government practice and vice dean for social responsibility in fact, of humanities at the University of Manchester um, and has considerable political expertise that uh, goes far beyond my knowledge of these things. Andy, may I turn to you? Thank you very much, Jagjit, and, and thank you very much, Jesse and, and Kitty, for the discussion so far. I think it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I wanted to, to switch a, a little bit now to, um, to, to the role of government itself and, 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 and the kind of the, the nature of policy making in broadly across the sort of productivity space and and um firstly to just to just kind of make the rather obvious point that uh, I, you know over the last 20 or 30 years the, the period where we've had a productivity problem um there, there's been a long and, and ever-changing list of initiatives <laughs> uh um that we've chopped and changed pretty frequently uh, uh not just not just between governments but often within governments of of the same uh, stripe um, and um, and I wonder if um, if you think that that churn, that constant churn of of initiatives in some of the areas we've discussed, uh, so skills policy, given that we've spent a lot of time talking about skills, is is probably the worst example where we've had you know what governments describe as a skills revolution every couple of years. Um, uh, regional policy uh, is is not far behind. So is is that is that kind of constant chopping and changing of 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 policy approaches, but also of the institutions that that deliver them, is that is that a really big part of of the the productivity problem, and is it something that government needs to uh, think rather more about um, in in uh, in the actions it takes uh, to uh, uh, to deal with uh, to deal with kind of productivity overall? Um, maybe I could um, ask. Jesse, that question first. 
Sure. Well, thank you, Andy. And thanks. That's an extremely good question. And, and before I respond to it, may I, may I can just nudge on to the, may I, may I mildly challenge the Productivity Commission to think about the, 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 the point raised about women's participation and progression, because I think that would be a really important aspect of the work. If you had the resources to do a bit of work on that, there is quite a developed literature in the area. It'd be helpful to just have it represented and reflected on as part of the work you do. Um, on this, are you absolutely right about churn and jeepers creepers one could go through a whole ra range of areas i mean skills policy is one uh you know uh social care um uh i mean or, or it's a churn or, or lack of policy because of the inability to form stable long-term uh, as it were coalitions of views that that then uh, can can support policy development um i suppose the other one that is uh, regional policy is a good example and i actually I mean, we don't often, I don't often agree with Liam Byrne, but I thought his suggestion of re regional interests for ministers, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not sure we need any more ministers. In fact, we probably need rather fewer, but um, I thought regional interests for ministers, quite an interesting idea because we, 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 are, we do need to think about um, that aspect of policy and to have someone taking a specific area, you know, we have trade envoys for different parts of the world, why not have ministers at least who can think about all of the different interests working within a particular sector. So you, so that you, you might get churn at the, at the top level, but you get more consistency lower, lower down. Uh, and then the other thing I would just say is there is, of course, a a tremendous problem overall in what you might call industrial policy. The nature, the whole idea of industrial policy has gone through a churn. So under Theresa May, the way I, I was at Bayes at the time, you know, we, we developed industrial policy. Then it turned out that the government didn't uh, have an industrial, well, decided it wasn't going to have an industrial policy. Whereas, of course, we all know that saying you don't have an industrial policy is having one without knowing it. And then it turned out that um, it, it, is, it is having an industrial policy, but it looks like it's one that isn't focused on Bayes and on industry and business, but is focused on DLUC and place and potential housing. So uh, we're obviously in a kind of policy stew at the moment as regards where we should be on, on that wide issue of what we historically call industrial business policy. Um, so I agree that what, what can we do about it? Well, I, I I do like the idea of uh, I, I like the idea of trying to beef up the quality of the conversations across government, and I, I think that that means that departments have got to become, uh, and in particular, Bayes has got to be a lesser department that represents, as it were, interests um, seeking support, and more of a department that thinks really that thinks productively about where long-term investment can be made, and. So, uh, you know, we spend an awful lot of time thinking about subsidizing sunset industries and very little time thinking about, you know, where the long term productive growth in the economy is going to come. And, you know, I had a slight insight into this because of the work that was being done on vaccines last year and industrial policy. That was a very, very easy, very interesting example of where some very, very smart people who really knew what they were talking about came together and very quickly put together, not just a response to the problem of getting vaccines, which thank God was successful, but also a whole industrial policy for life sciences, which the government still is not following through adequately, despite it having been laid out for it. And it's very interesting and slightly sad that that has happened because um, there were some very obvious wins there that would have placed us um, in a very favorable long-term position for the production of any number of a range of different, uh, uh, as it were, medicines or drugs uh, to public benefit at relatively low cost. And so that is an example where I think we can think about place, but we can also think about sectors, but we have to do it in a rather different way than from the way we're doing at the moment, not necessarily more expensively by any means, um, but just differently. And, and it, has to, it has to draw on expertise in a way that isn't always cashed out in the civil service mindset as uh, predatory um, attempts to uh, as it were, rook the public purse. Uh, thanks very much, but maybe we can come back a little bit to the place and the kind of levelling up a, a, a agenda in a in a minute. But um, could I ask you, Kitty, uh, what what you think about kind of you know the problem, the problem and challenge of churn? I think it's more of an issue in some policy areas than others. I'm actually more relaxed about it in terms of skills, and I think if you take a longer term perspective, 
you know, what has changed over maybe 30 years is that young people are leaving education at a higher skill level than they than our, our parents' generation, for, for example, uh, which is great. What I am more worried about, I think I probably agree with Jesse here from what he was saying, is where this churn in um, areas of uh, policy leadership that actually depend on convening power and relationships. So I would put regional policy and the regional uh, sort of delivery mechanisms and structures, whether they're local authority or, or other regional development type um, structures in, in that camp, because um, people get people get to know each other and then when the institutions are ripped apart you have to start all over again and you lose about five or ten years um and uh, the other example is exactly as jesse said with the industrial s s strategies i can't say that word and um uh where i think government underestimates the the um uh, sort of comfortableness that the business has that government has a role to lead here and that government has a convening power of bringing uh, players together so jesse mentioned the life sciences but i mean there was a phase I think in the coalition government where there was really big work streams across all industrial sectors that were convened by government. So I think they were hugely impactful, just bringing people together in a way that wasn't an issue for competition policy to share ideas about what was needed in the future and uh, work out how to work together uh, to achieve that. Um, and I think government has a really clear role there. And if you start it for a few years and then stop, uh, then you lose something. <laughs> and um, I think it's a real, it's a real loss uh, there. Yes, uh, I, I agree. I mean, there, there's a very, I mean, many, many people will have read it. There's a very good Institute for Government report from a few years ago, 2017, I think, where they picked, they picked three, three of the worst offenders in, in, uh, um, in, in policy churn and its, its skills, <laughs> uh, regional policy and industrial strategy. Right. Okay. And so, you know, these are the three things that we're, <laughs> we're, we're talking about in, in great detail here in, here in this session. So, so, so it, I guess in some ways the the issue is that is that we might well have stumbled on the right arrangements, but then probably ripped them up five minutes, uh, five minutes later and replaced them with a with, with a different approach. But um, if you put me one one really quick reflection no, no, as well, please. having wor worked both in government and um, in a business representative organisations, um, I think government tend of all political parties tend to sort of slightly worship the private sector and say, oh, you should go and do your thing and then everything will be wonderful, Adam Smith and so on. And I, and I think business slightly accepts government's right to lead. And we saw that during the pandemic in a very extreme case. But I think in general as well, what business says is, well, where's the leadership? Where's the strategy? Where's the overarching business plan that we can work out where our company fits in? And if both sides are saying that, then there's a massive gap in the middle. Um, and actually we would all benefit from that gap being filled. I think that's really a really good point. And it lead, leads me on to, to a question about, about where, where this is all managed from. And, and I think, um, Rather than ask ask where do you think it's all managed from, I'm going to assume that most of us here would say it starts with the treasury <laughs> uh, uh, at the centre and at the kind of top of power, and some of those gaps are, are elsewhere in Whitehall and and maybe then on into sectors and and regions. Um, so so on 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 that level, I kind of want, wanted to ask ask both of you whether whether you think there's a a, a is that a problem that that you know treasury at the centre is 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 the absolute kind of controller of everything in this space um uh, and and secondly is there is there a bit of a disregard uh it, within treasury for uh, all all the institutions in this space whether they are other departments in whitehall or uh institutions out in the regions and and, and whether there's a kind of a, a problem that the treasury has with institutions other than itself of course uh um Maybe I'll, uh, as Jesse's smiling, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask that question, that, those two questions to you, Jesse. Probably a smile of naked fear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, uh, look, I mean, Kitty and I both spent time in the Treasury, and um, therefore I think we're allowed to be um, extravagantly full of praise, but also qualified in one or two other things. And let's start from the point that someone has got to stop the politicians from spending all the money. Right. That's the first point. And, you know, when you have a democracy that is increasingly driven by, you know, concern about social media and 24 hour news, 24 uh, seven uh, uh, news cycle and, you know, particular forms of, you know, social panic about particular issues from time to time, let alone macro and economic crises of the kind that we've seen 
in the last few years, those demands on the Treasury become very, very strong indeed. And we desperately need someone to exercise that function of saying, by the way, I forget what the question was, but the answer is no. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, having said that, you know, the Treasury, we are asking the Treasury to do a big job because we're asking it to be both the finance ministry and an economic ministry. And the point I have made consistently over the last hour and a half is that we're not allowing the proper conversation that should emerge between economic ministries in different ways, by which I mean Bayes, DLUC and uh, DFT in particular, as opposed to what you might call social spending ministries such as DWP and DHSC. Um, we're not allowing those economic ministries and we're, not, and we're not requiring them to be good enough clients to really make persuasive investment cases, I think. And uh, I think that's a structural problem in government. Now, Treasury's only got 2,000 people. It massively benefits from everyone thinking the answer is no always and we're not interested to talk to the hand um, and we're omnicompetent um, omni and omnipotent. But of course, none of that is true. And if I was going to be slightly, as they say, on the constructive side, I would say this. Um, the Treasury is full of extremely expert people, and in particular on the tax side, which I was very fortunate to be, you know, that was my, that was my side, I was in charge of tax policy, furlough schemes, HMRC, um, as well as infrastructure when I was the Treasury. Uh, and that's fantastic because we need that reservoir of talent and some people there who really, a lot of people there who really know what they're doing at the very micro level as well as overall. The, I think the story is somewhat different on the spending side. I'm, I was never a spending minister, so I could never, uh, uh, within the Treasury, and that would be the Chief Secretary rather than the Financial Secretary, but I worry that there is a, there is a deep institutional panic in the Treasury at the idea of um, persuasive business investment cases, because that means money gets spent, and therefore is in some sense contradictory to the original purpose, which is we need to protect the public finances and so i and, and the effect of that is that often uh uh as it were you get you get a perfectly proper resistance to barking investment ideas from the latest wheeze of politicians but you also get uh a, a very blanket no to thoroughly sensible intelligent long-term industrial bets so my suggestion if i may make a suggestion to the project commission is that it look at the idea of recommending a business investment committee or some such investment commit, commitment committee to be set up within the treasury, which involves people who are not treasury civil servants. You might have deep expertise uh, and would allow the treasury to, to have more than one, uh, to, to have an additional register to its thinking in this area. Because at the moment, the treasury behaves more like a bank, right? Money is available. If it's available, uh, very reluctantly is it granted, it tends to be in the form of debt, uh, uh, the debt is subject to bank type covenants and the result is fine for uh, organizations and parts of government, uh, regional organizations, local organizations that can sustain that kind of structure, but ruinous to what you might call venture capital investment. Because venture capital investment is a different kind of investment. It's not, um, it's one which is releases cash progressively against milestones where you have to be flexible about whether that milestone has been well achieved or not. And you can't be, you can't be so aggressive in tying down the amount of cash that the organization has that it dies because it misses one payment or it, receive, doesn't, it receives a payment that is due in its cash accounts one month. And so it's a different mindset. And I think a business investment committee or some such within the Treasury would allow it to draw on thoroughly expert uh, 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 sources of um, knowledge in this area alongside civil servants knowledge, which is often quite limited of business and quite suspicious of business as such, um, in order to allow them to make more calibrated and more venture capital type decisions in some of these marginal cases. And I think that could be potentially quite a useful addition. It would also strengthen the Treasury when a spurious business justification is being presented by some other minister or some political lobby group by saying, look, we've brought in, we have this separate group of experts who really have you know, spent 30 very combined hundreds of years investing in venture capital organizations, and we've decided it's not a flyer, and therefore it's been a pleasure. So I think that idea is something that I would encourage the commission director. It may decide it's a rubbish idea, or it may decide it has some value, but that would address what I see to be a structural, uh, intellectual and experiential limitation within the treasuries it's presently set up.
Now that's great. I'm sure. I'm sure we will look at that, and I think it's a it's a very good idea to do so. Um, uh, if I could ask ask sort of that question and modify it slightly, Kitty, just to say, um, you, you know, in the context of levelling up, which obviously you know we're all thinking about, and and regional inequality. Uh, I mean, how much do you think the Treasury buy into that, and uh, how much do you think they um, uh, um, they will sit back and allow the Department for levelling up to coordinate kind of all of these? Uh, uh, agendas across across government when when you know they might they might think that's more that's more their job. Mm. I think Jesse put his finger on it when he said that the, the key question was that the Treasury was currently being a finance minis ministry and an economics ministry, um, and sort of what what who's currently doing the economic ministry side of it outside the Treasury uh, and feels like it's coming from quite near Michael Gove at the moment. Um, I'm not close enough to uh, to what's going on right now to know what, what sort of how much hostility that there is to the Department for Leveling Up's uh, attempt to become the Economics Ministry. Um, but I suspect that that document wouldn't have been published if there was serious resistance. And what I actually thought that was most powerful ab ab about the Leveling Up white paper was not so much the individual paragraphs, but the mechanism for holding the whole of government to account um, according to these new metrics, which smelt to me, I don't know what Jesse thinks, but smelt to me like it was a new, uh, was um, something that the whole of the civil service could sign up to and was a very clear sort of steer to government as to what good now looked like. And these were the new metrics that, that, that we should be using. So I thought that was potentially incredibly powerful. The problem with it, and I'm not suggesting the government will ever change political hue <laughs> but the problem with it is that leveling up is associated with one particular political party and so it may not therefore survive a general election which gets us back into the uh, churn point having said that of course regional policy has pretty much got a cross-party consensus so there may be it may work in a, in a in a in a different way and if it's legislated for that will probably make a difference uh, as well um, I would also like to draw the Commission's attention to uh, a paper I wrote in 2010 called National Treasure on the Future of the Treasury, uh, which I'm happy to send to you, which covers some of these points. Thank you very much, Kitty. I, 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 I know the paper well. Uh, oh, um, I'm very, very flattered. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, I, I'm re I'll resist the temptation to ask Jesse how it smelt to him. Not that paper. Uh, but the uh, the diagnosis of the levelling up white paper. But, well, uh, let, and, but let me just say one thing on that, Andy, if I may, which is I think, um, uh, look, uh, the, the Treasury doesn't want people to spend money stupidly, right? It really doesn't. And that's a very good thing, for which we all should be profoundly grateful. And I, I agree with Kitty. I, I think the levelling up white paper was very important because even if there isn't an enormous amount of new money associated with that institution, that the, 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 the publication of that, it is an attempt to engender a more intelligent conversation about how regional policy is going to be undertaken. And I think the Treasury is very much in favour of that because it wants better outcomes for the economy. The only other thing to add to this, of course, is that in the budget that was just before the pandemic really took off, so the first March budget 2020, the OBR said for the first time ever that the GDP grows with capital spending increases by government. So it was the first time that it was sort of officially acknowledged that the more capital expenditure is, <laughs> uh, the more that, that actually that actually pays back. Um, which almost, you know, obviously there's a limit to this, but almost implies that the more you have, the better, which maybe slightly goes to the point about um, uh, what type of investment is worth investing in, actually. <laughs> Proper, properly spent capital investment is always good news for the Treasury, officially now. Uh, absolutely. Look, I've, I've, I've overrun on my question, so, so I must very quickly, uh, uh, but shall I pass directly to Adrian or, or via, yes, let me pass directly to Adrian, who's my co-director on the governance and institutions theme. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, Andy, and, and thank you so much, uh, Kitty and, and Jesse, for what's been absolutely uh, invaluable uh, evidence so far. Um, I'd like to pick up on one of the points that was made in the conversation just now with Andy uh, and start with an institutional question. Do you think there is a case to have a department either focusing solely on productivity or maybe a sort of economics ministry that has a very strong focus on productivity? And if so, where would that leave base? So in that kind of conversation, Treasury leveling up department, possibly something new like an economics department with productivity, 
you know, what do you think institutionally could and should be done to just make sure that government across departments focuses on productivity, which is, I think, what we're saying needs to happen if we're going to, you know, have higher productivity growth over time. You know, that that sort of single mindedness about productivity is really crucial. But in institutional terms, when, when you look at government, what would you think would be the best way to do that? Can I maybe start with Kitty and then Jesse? Well, it would have to income. It would have to be made up of I can't everything. Hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Sorry, I can now. Yes, sorry. Apologies if that was a problem on my end. Um, well, the, your new economics department would, would have to consist of all the current bits of government that are not purely the spending finance ministry. So you'd have to you'd have, you'd have the accountant ministry, which is purely the finance bit, and then everything else would have to be your new economics ministry. So in the way that it's currently constituted, it would have to be Bayes plus levelling up insofar as that's currently leading uh, things. And there's probably then a debate about how much skills goes in there as well. Um, and it would probably need to take over the financial services sponsorship section of the Treasury as well. So it would basically be in charge of all industrial and regional policy, I would say. Thank you. And Jesse? I mean, I think that's a very interesting suggestion. I, uh, I mean, the other counterpart view would be to would be to, I mean, it sounds ironic because they were put together originally, but would be to create a um, a net zero slash environmental department out of Bayes and then and then target all three of them. Uh, I mean, all, all of the economic departments, including that new one as a uh, under a productivity mandate. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that the Department of Productivity as such is a useful thought and i do think that in part it's because uh, we really need to get that culture embedded across government now that may mean that you have to have ministers who have an explicit focus on productivity within uh within as it were uh, business facing or regional policy facing departments uh, but i i would be nervous about uh setting up more departments that as it were didn't already follow fairly well established lines and i would be worried about um the process of change itself which has the effect often of just destabilizing and undermining uh, good practice and getting in the way of what we really want which is you know better quality conversations across government about where to where to deploy public resources yeah i think the, the important thing i mean i answered your question directly what would happen to Bayes, but um i think far more important is sort of leadership of thoughts and understanding what needs to happen. Um, I, I've been reminded of it's, it's ancient history because of my experience in government was a long time ago, but um, when I was there, there was a sort of a sense of the five drivers of productivity that had come out of the treasury, but uh, was being implemented across government. And so it was that coherence of thought that was important actually, rather than the institutional structure. But of course the, tre the treasury was really using its role as an economic policy um, department at that point. But that included skills and competition policy and all the rest of it. Yeah, and I think this is the really interesting point I think you're both making, which is it's it's about leadership. So who does it in the various departments, uh, but also how does it add up to something coherent? So, you know, where's the coherent framework so that it gets properly embedded across government and not just in, in, a, in a couple of, of departments? Um, can I then uh, move on to my next question, which is about the sort of policy areas, policy issues that you think, given your experience, the Commission should focus on going forward? I mean, we've mentioned already some of them, right? Skills, uh, you know, we looked at industrial policy and strategy a bit, you know, you've mentioned, um, you know, the whole way of doing regional policy through the levelling up department now, but, but are there other policy issues or areas that you think the Productivity Commission, you know, should focus on in the in the months and years ahead? And, and which ones would they be? Maybe Jesse, because you were you were nodding, so uh, I'll, I'll turn to you first. And I must I must stop gesturing in any form when people are talking because <laughs> <they're... laughs> uh, no, uh, I look. Well, I've already touched on several potential sets of ideas. Um, I think in skills, this idea of specialist tech and engineering universities, the kind I've described, that can be deployed around the country uh, in you know to, uh, opening up the jobs market through different forms of advertisements that allow women and then 
putting uh, to, 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 to sustain their jobs uh, and their skills and to maintain them and other measures to support it. Uh, I've we've talked a little bit about the idea of you know, some of the constraints in the tax system on productivity and whether there's an element there to be addressed. I've talked about whether or not uh, the structure of the way in which the Treasury thinks about investment ought to be adjusted. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. It might be some interest to you guys to pick up. We'll have to see. Uh, the, the one I think that we haven't really touched on, but which I think is useful, is what you might call the next stage of regional policy. And what I, what I mean by that, it essentially ties some of the insights that we've discussed already. So what it says really for a defined area, define it how you like, might be a city, might be a region, might be a city region, might be a, a rural region, is that essentially principles which have been understood and known since the time of Michael Heseltine, and I'm sure before that, should just be adopted as maxims and rules of thumb by government uh, for regional policy. And they are very simple. The first is that uh, the policy should begin from a broad base of public support. And if that's an institution, that might involve, you know, a thousand donors giving a sum of money each or 10,000 giving a, a serious base of local support showing that a set of ideas has got some real traction. Uh, it should include uh, support from local institutions, obviously the local councils or the LEPs or whatever their successor organizations may be need to be tied in. It needs to be sufficiently broad based and established that it is not subject to partisan bickering or change and therefore can sustain survive a change in mayoralty or change in leadership whatever it might be uh, and then it has to focus and develop a an economic regeneration strategy for that area probably very heavily involving skills because that's inevitably part of it but it might be involving infrastructure and other aspects and then it has to approach government with a a, a structured series of asks where the where, the, where the, the, the request has the following form. If you give us the availability of uh, uh, this money in such and such a period, we will do this by that time. And paradoxically, by the same token, if we do this by that time, you guarantee to us that you will have uh, responding capital or, or, or revenue uh, amounts. And it can't be for three years, which is the Treasury standard view, right? It has to be, we've waived that already in the case of infrastructure investment. We know we have, you know, five-year road investment strategies and the rest of it. Um, and we desperately need to get away from three-year planning for capital investment in government anyway. I mean, the idea that HMRC can make meaningful change to a digital tax system with all the benefits that, that would have, a project I launched uh, about 18 months ago, the idea that you can do that on the basis of three-year spending is a completely barking, right? You need five to 10-year plans, well understood, well articulated, to which each spending round has to make a, a certain initial commitment. And But you say to, to, to these uh, cities or these uh, regions, uh, uh, if, you, if you fulfill all those conditions of local support, um, broad base, no politics, expert institutions involved, a growth-oriented regional generation strategy, then we will meet you as government with um, structured investment over five or 10 years. Uh, and we won't be captious about whether you fulfill, if you're making enough progress, we will, we will do our side of it. In other words, we will adopt what I consider a venture capital mindset rather than a, a bank mindset. So that I think if you do that, then there are lots of parts of the country, and the marches is an example we're trying to do at the moment in Herefordshire, and that's why I'm generalizing on the basis of some experience. Um, uh, uh, there's lots of experience, I think lots of evidence that you crowd in uh, capital from businesses, and, and, and you also, of course, potentially crowd in um, revenue spend on training and skills because people know that the structure of the investment is likely to yield uh, outcomes. And, if you can do so in areas which have clusters built around them, perhaps because of anchor tenant investors has already occurred in various parts of the country, then I think you really can start to make serious change. And let me just give you a little example. Um, again, it's one I know well, but think of the cluster that goes GCHQ in Cheltenham, Malvern, where Kinetic is, and, uh, and Hereford. Um, you know, there's a, that is a potential defence and security cluster of, you know, world-beating dimensions. Th there ought to be a way in which that uh, that area can come together and create a long term investment structure across diverse political uh, uh, lines and and to everyone's long term benefit. If they do that, I think it, it's massively accretive for economic growth and for skills improvement. Thank you. So 
I think what you're saying just in a nutshell is, you know, locally led sort of regeneration plans, but with central commitments, you know, always sort of conditional on, on progress and, and over a period of five to 10 years, rather than the kind of shorter term, yeah. you know. And, yeah, and, and where, and where the, the, the leveraging effect is such that the energies, the local energies are not hopelessly and constantly devoted towards pleasing government. Um, but a focus where they ought to be, which is on raising investment, you know, recruiting companies uh, and and building the basis of future long term growth. I think that's the kind of approach that I would advocate. Thank you. Chrissy, on policy issues or areas for the Commission to uh, focus on. Well, I, I hugely welcome the fact that you're you, that you're doing this at all. It's a very complicated area, obviously. Um, I think I would sort of pose the question like this. Um, so we know as economists that productivity and pay are almost, you know, the same concept, really. So but we also know that, um, you know, so if we're trying to raise productivity, a good proxy is to raise raise pay. Um, we also know that the economy is just all the individual decisions uh, of individual economic actors, mainly just humans, uh, some of them running companies, uh, aggregated together. So I would take, I urge you to sort of continue sort of taking a, a people based approach to productivity and working out what is it that's stopping different demographics from raising their pay level um is it that government needs to do something is it that someone else needs to do something is it that they need to think differently um what is do they want to if they do want to what's stopping it happen if they don't want to can they be encouraged um and thinking about that across every single different cohort because if we can actually unblock <laughs> what's happening for, for individual people uh, all of the time then it starts to sort of flow through and that is an unconventional way of describing economics and I say to someone who has enough confidence to say it because you know I've done some bit, bit of <laughs> uh, dry economics in my life as well um, but I, I think it would get underneath some of the the societal and structural problems that are uh, stopping Britain from raising its level of productivity. Um, so we shouldn't try and necessarily be like other countries. We should work out what the blockages are uh, in, in, in our country. Um, I haven't talked a huge amount about, uh, about place, uh, but uh, I would just add one thing to Jesse's suggestion, which I think is really well made, uh, which is I'm not completely convinced that uh, the regeneration profession is uh, exists is large enough, um, and so uh, I think there could be a professionalisation within LEPs and local authorities that would, that would help hugely in actually drawing up these plans that they then seek venture capital type public funding uh, for. Because what 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 you don't want is something that everyone locally thinks is a great idea, but actually won't unblock the, the, the barriers to people raising their own individual levels of pay which is linked to higher productivity uh, in that in in that local area thank you kitty very much um i think that sort of balance but also the tension between place-based and people's based strategies and policies is a really important one for us to think about in the commission um because not all problems are you know place-based or people-based but it's you know it's working out which one we um you know which one we tackle how but also how to combine them so i think that's that's really helpful so thank you i've got one final question for for you both and and that is about how the commission can best influence government you know uh once it's developed some of the policy recommendations based on future sessions so from your experience you know how does one best influence government not not in terms of you know any particular interest or agenda that we have, but generally for the for the public good, you know, so what what policies uh, and how do you influence government in a way that, you know, can advance this productivity agenda, uh, you know, so that, you know, we can also really make a contribution that perhaps hasn't been made because we haven't had a productivity commission so far in this country. I think there's only one I'll answer that question and that's to co-create. I think you need to involve the, the people in the development of the questions and um, perhaps you're doing that by inviting them to give evidence myself excluded obviously is not being important enough in government um, but uh, you have to get their attention by solving their problems for them not the problems you think they should have the problems they really have in their own heads 
that's how I would, I would do advocacy. That advice is worth a large amount of money. I'll send you my invoice. <laughs> <laughs> the Commission doesn't have quite the same resources as in other countries. So we can't uh, we can't perhaps uh you know pay that immediately but <laughs> uh, an invoice in a, in a foreign currency that i won't mention right now might might go a long way towards uh you know uh, helping there but uh, thank you kitty that, that's very helpful jesse I don't think you've got enough money to pay kiddies bills, but, uh, you know, um, a non-trivial ruble check to an offshore account, I'm sure will get out very well. <laughs> no, I, I would um, uh, I, I would say this. Um, uh, it's absolutely right to talk about co-creation. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't have a public hearing where you actually ask ministers to um, take part. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I would say one other thing, which is, look, the, the, the proof of everything, the proof of all thinking lies in its actual or conceivable um effects and the same is true with policy right so um why not if you can, can either use or find external money to just find some best practice in each of these areas to illustrate the points you're making and then get stuck in because what people will respect and understand is the practical payoffs that come with this and and the policy will be infinitely better if the practical payoffs have been properly explored in a small number of leading cases. And of course, I would say this, wouldn't I? But if you want to come to the marches, we'd love to have you. But if you've got those kinds of examples and you choose them strategically around the country, you will have the automatic interest of the mayor and the MPs and the ministers involved. And so that would be another way of co-creating as you go or or creating a, a next phase and i don't see any reason why you shouldn't approach you know business or other organizations to support that because they have a very long-term interest in you getting the right answers and getting them embedded within government well thank you very much both of you that they were really fascinating answers to the questions i had so i'll let me uh turn it back to judge it okay well thank you very much um Jesse and Kitty in particular, the, but also the commissioners who've joined us today, we weren't able to get everyone on to ask the questions that they want to, but I know other commissioners on the call today, Rachel, um, um, Alan, Bart, Steen, um, uh, wanted to ask some questions, but uh, it, it's been difficult to, to arrange that given the, the way we're currently arrayed, but we will, we will certainly follow up on, on the things that have been raised, and Cecilia as well put a very good question into us. But a couple of questions from the floor as well on, on digitalization and also whether the recording of this will be available. Uh, Matt Pantelli, who's sitting to my right, will assure me that the recording uh, will be available. Um, and we're writing these up as, as a report that will be publicly available for everyone to work on. And the work on digitalization is a very good paper at the Productivity Institute uh, website on the issues connected with digitalization. So I will ensure that that is sent to you. Um, the person who asked the question, forgive me, is Lau. We'll ensure that's sent to you if you provide your email address um, to us, Lau. We'll get that paper sent to you. And if you've got any comments on that paper, uh, please, please do come back to us. I, I think just for me, finish. I, uh, I, I, what I'm hearing today is, is a lot of good stuff about the long run. How we improve the real side of the economy, how we're going to get local institutions involved and, 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 and invested um, their local reputations in the future in combination with what goes on in Whitehall and elsewhere. And I think that's gonna take time. Building up the levels of education is not something we're going to do particularly quickly. Investing in people also takes time. Um, the cult changing the culture imperative, thinking about the aggregate rather than the individual, which is an issue I think that came up with business training. And the question of the structure of government is one that you know, I, I, I wasn't around at the time, but we know that there was a Department for Economic Affairs set up in the 1960s. It was very short lived, partly because of the person who was appointed, but uh, that's a story for another day. Uh, but there is a definite question as to whether economic affairs might be better dealt with with a different institutional structure than that we currently have in Whitehall. And I think it comes up so often, it's something we might want to think about as well. And then there's this really interesting question about whether we can change the mindset of people at Treasury to move away from expenditure control to investment and capital ventures. And this goes back to the idea of thinking hard about the net worth of the public sector. Can we do more to build that up um, over time? And um, I was asked earlier whether anyone's run a small business. Actually, NISA is a non-for-profit charity, but it is a small business. And I'm always intrigued every day
at the tension between those controlling our finances, who are saying, we can't do this because it costs too much money, and those with an entrepreneurial bent and spirit who want to develop what we do to answer the national question. And I think that's a very interesting question to put back to Treasury as well. Um, is it thinking in the long run? Is it not the case that too many people here are invested in returns or consequences that will matter over a very short term, not over a very long term? And if there are short run costs, maybe people aren't prepared to pay that because they don't feel that they're going to benefit from the long term better future. And I think some of the points we made about the responses to the financial crisis are also interesting. It was because of the financial crisis that the banking sector was finally forced or encouraged to increase its capital and liquidity requirements. And that has subsequently left it more resilient, which goes back to the point Jesse made right at the beginning in response to the shocks that we face time and time again in the last decade or more. And that's an interesting point at which we reached. And that might be a question for us to consider in a whole other host of economic policy areas as well. But that's not a conclusion, that's a thought very much triggered by a very wet um, afternoon, but what has been a very, very excellent discussion. I want to thank the team at NISA, Pat, Matt Pantelli, Nick Neil Lakeland and his friend and his colleagues for putting this on, in particular Rhiannon, also on obviously the Productivity Institute for uh, providing the backdrop for all of this work. And as I said earlier, Adrian and myself were in Leeds last week to try and understand some of the ideas that are working in the North or plan to be working in the North. And uh, this afternoon, we're in the east of England, and we're, we're very grateful for the hospitality of Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge, uh, for allowing us to come together this afternoon on this rather wet day, but understanding better what also happens in a city such as Cambridge. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank you for those who joined online. The video will be a recording will be available shortly. We expect the reports to be coming out um, sometime in the spring and summer, which we would love comments. Thank you all for joining, um, and I'll see you all very soon. In the meanwhile, get your galoshes on and your umbrellas out. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.